All right, welcome back to our online Bible study. We are continuing looking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse that it's sometimes called in the book of Revelation. And everything seems to be so timely. So the fact that the Lord has led me in this direction and then events and circumstances seems to line up with what it's talking about. I'm saying, wow, Lord. Are you really speaking here? Are you showing us what the fulfillment of what uh, John saw in Revelation? So we're looking today at the uh, third horse. We've looked at the rider of the white horse and the red horse. And now we come to the rider on the black horse. So, Father, I just come to you this morning, and I just pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you, Father. We thank you that you know the end from the beginning. You know what is going to happen before it actually happens, and you want us to be prepared, and you want us to know it is truly a blessing just like you've said when you be, when John began writing down the book of Revelation, that this would be a blessing to those who read and understand what is said here. Because you will not do anything except you reverse reveal it to your prophets. So, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you love us and that you're caring for us and that you know all things, and that you're bringing these things to pass, even in our day and age. So, Father, we just want to be prepared. We want to be ready. We want to be like the tribe of Issachar, that it said that they were men who understood the times, understood the times and the seasons in which they were living that they could understand what you were communicating. So, Father, give us wisdom and give us discernment as we live these days and help us to be ready and prepared for no matter what happens because we know that you're still with us and that you will be with us, as Jesus said, to the very end. So thank you and praise you. We give you the glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's look at this third horse rider, and we'll find that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, talking about the Lamb or talking about Jesus Christ, he opened the third seal in John's vision, and he said, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, you hurt not the oil and the wine. So the rider of this third horse it was a black horse, and the rider had a pair of scales in his hands, or a pair of balances. This was what they used in the marketplace to weigh out their wheat or their barley, their grains, etc., so that they would know exactly how much that they had and how much to uh, ask the people to spend on those items. So the pair of scales were part of their economic system, if you will. So when you see a pair of scales, that's what it's talking about. I know years ago they used to have those, uh, when you go to the produce section, you would have those balances or those scales that you would put your items on so that you could weigh out because you know uh, the produce is sold by the pound 
And so they would have the scales there so that you would know exactly how many pounds you had and therefore you'd know how much money that you would have to spend on that. So in verse 6 again it says that I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a measure, a measure of wheat for a day's wages and three measures of barley for a day's wages. And do not hurt the oil and the wine. So the rider on the white, um, I mean on the black horse, he has a pair of scales, as it said, but also it talks about a measure of wheat. So it says a measure of wheat would cost a denarius, or that would be the equivalent of a day's wages. So in other words, a loaf of bread would cost you a day's wages. So a whole day's wage for enough wheat or barley for one person for one day. So what is this talking about? Well, it's talking about the economic hardship that follows the white and the red horse. When you have war, then that can also cause devastation economically in some places. And so there's going to be economic hardship. It's going to be inflation like we've never saw it before. It's not famine. If you had the money, you could get food. But the thing is that your your dollar just will not go very far if you live, you know, just using our currency. But wherever you are in the world, it would take a day's wage just to put food on your table. But then you have the oil and the wine that represents the comforts of wealth. And it says, don't hurt them. All right, so it's okay to have the wheat, the food, and the barley. It's okay that there be an uh, inflation there, but let's don't mess with the oil and the wine, okay? Because that's for the rich. Only the rich could afford those kinds of things. But it's very reminiscent of what we read back in the book of Exodus. As you remember when uh, Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness. And as it turned out, they spent 40 years there. They didn't have to because it wasn't that far from Egypt to the promised land. But we know because of their stubbornness and that they needed to get a lot of Egypt out of them. And it was a whole generation that died out in the wilderness. A new generation that did not know Egypt, they were the ones that went in and took possession of the land. But nevertheless, it says the people, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron and said, why would you bring us out here to starve to death? Because there wasn't any marketplaces. There wasn't any grocery stores. There wasn't any farms. It was just sand. It was just desert. And so Moses goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what am I going to do? How can I feed these people? I don't have the resources. So what am I supposed to do? And so the Lord responds by telling Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Okay, so we we know that what this is talking about is manna. Now, in the Hebrew language, the manna meant, what is it? Because the people went out and they looked at it and said, what is that? You know, because it just rained down and it was on the desert floor. And it it was white and it looked like, you know, a flake or something. Looked like it rained, looked like it snowed or something, you know, on the desert floor. But the Lord gave Moses instructions about it, and he says, The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In other words, they weren't supposed to get more than enough for 
uh, that day. They were not to stockpile. They were not to try to save it up because if they did, it would ruin. It would get maggots. That is, except on the sixth day, they could gather twice as much so they wouldn't have to go out on the Sabbath to collect it so that they could rest so that they wouldn't have to work on the Sabbath. That was the only exception to this rule. So the people were go, were to go out, and they were to get an exact measurement for each person. Now, they called it an omer. That was their measurement. That's all that one person was supposed to have for that entire day. And so they would collect enough omers for the people in their family. And they weren't to collect any more than that. Just enough for each person for that day. And God said, in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. He wanted to see how they were willing to obey him and to trust him. You know, we're supposed to trust in the Lord. The just are supposed to live by faith. We're to live by faith. We're to trust God every day for our daily bread. Now, it continues on, and it tells us in verse 18, when they measured it with an omer, that was their form of measurement. It's like for us a cup or a cup and a half or whatever the omer was equivalent to. That's their type of measurement. It said, he who gathered much had nothing over, and he who gathered little had no lack. In other words, they took an omer for each person for that day. And so they never had too, not enough, and they never had too much. Everybody had just the right amount of food for each day. So they gathered every man according to his eating. Like I said, an omer per person per day. That was the measurement. So when they went out, you know, some people look like they had a lot, but they had a lot of people in their family. And some people may, had, may have had one or two in their family, so they didn't have a whole lot, but they had a measure for each person in their family. So nobody went without. Everybody got the same amount. And then Moses said to them, let no one leave of it until the morning. So don't try to keep it for the next day because it just will not work. It will ruin. Now, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he was given some instructions for the church there at Corinth about the same principle about helping out other people knowing that sometimes we have a surplus and that because of our surplus, we're able to help other people so that when we are in need and we need help, then other people who have a surplus can help us. So we're to take care of one another. So this is what he's trying to discuss here. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, for this is not for the ease of others or and for your affliction, but by the way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need. He was talking about the church at Jerusalem. They were trying to take up an offering because Jerusalem was suffering a famine at that time. And here Corinth had a surplus of food and supplies. And so Paul is saying that because you have an abundance, you can help meet the needs of those in Jerusalem who are now enduring a famine so that your their abundance also may become a supply for your need that there may be equality. So he's saying, you know, what goes around comes around. If you help the church out there in Jerusalem, there may be uh, may come a time when you need help 
and then they will be able to help you. So we help each other out is what he's trying to get across. But the point, verse 15, as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. He was quoting from Exodus about how they went out and collected the manna, and they did it by measure. They did it by one omer per person per day. And he said nobody had too much, and there were n nobody had no lack either. Everybody had the same amount every day, so everybody was taken care of. So there was equality as far as the needs of the people. Now, when we talk about economic disaster or economic problem, I know there's been a lot of um, ministers who have been talking about um, how we're supposed to stock up. Uh, you know, they're called the preppers, that we know that there's going to come a time of economic hardship and that we need to stock up and, uh, you know, save up and, and stockpile all our supplies so that when the hard times come, that we'll have it. But I think the principle that God was showing for us as we look in Exodus, going back to before the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, and how the plagues began to come upon the Egyptians because Moses kept going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh was stubborn and he would not let them go. And so God began to send plagues upon the Egyptian. Well, on the third plague, that's when God began to make a difference. And then as you go forward in chapter 19, in chapter 9 of Exodus, it says, And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. So God was able to make a distinction between the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. God, in other words, would not let the plague come upon the Hebrew people. And it would affect the Egyptians. So there was a distinction. So I think even in economic hardship, even when there's plagues, even when there's tribulation that it talks about in the book of Revelation, that God knows how to make a distinction between those that are his and those that are of the world, those who are unrepentant, like Pharaoh was, and those who are his children. You know, if you've got kids, you're going to take care of them, right? You're going to put them first, and you're going to make sure that they have food on their table and that they don't have anything lacking. Well, I believe that even in the tribulation period, even when we go through trials and, you know, some compare what goes on in the book of Revelation to the plagues of Egypt, a lot of them are similar as far as that is concerned. And so I think the principle is there that God is able to make a distinction and what I'm trying to say is that we need to put our trust in the Lord that he's going to take care of us even in the midst of hard times. It's not that, you know, there's anything wrong with storing up a little bit, but when we become very excessive in this, to know that we just need to, to trust that God is able to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, in the book of De Deuteronomy chapter 28, God is describing the blessings and the cursings that would fall upon those who were obedient to the Lord. 
or disobedient to the Lord. But as far as those who are obedient to the Lord, it says in verse 4, the fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land, the young of your livestock, and the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. goes on in verse 8. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord will bless you in the land he has given you. So God is giving a commanded blessing upon those who walk with the Lord, those who are obedient. Jesus said, those that love me will obey me. You'll do what I say. You'll forgive. You'll give. You'll be generous. You'll be compassionate. You'll reach out and help other people, like the man that Jesus talked about on the Jericho Road, the Good Samaritan that came by. So if we follow the commands of the Lord, if it's part of who our DNA and part of who we are, then God says, I'm going to send a blessing on your barns and on everything that you put your hand on. I love this story of George Mueller. He lived back in the 1800s. He lived in Bristol, England. But he was a very godly man and a very compassionate man. And he looked at the homeless people. He looked at the orphans. And he was able to establish five orphanages that cost more than 100,000, is that pounds? Uh, I, don't, I don't know English uh, monetary currency. But uh, 100,000 to build those orphanage homes. But you know what? I love the story about George Mueller because he didn't have the resources to take care or make provision for uh, all the orphans that came into his homes. And many times it says he received unsolicited food do donations only hours before they were needed to feed the children. And this further strengthened his faith. So Mueller was a man of prayer. He was in constant prayer that God would touch the hearts of donors to make provisions for the orphans. And so there's one good example of this. It's a well-documented example of how George Mueller would pray and God would bring the provision. So he had the kids get around the table and there wasn't any food on the table. But George would pray and he would give thanks. And this was at breakfast time. Nothing on the table. They had no food in the house. And all the children were sitting at the table, even though there was nothing to eat in the house. But when George Mueller finished praying, they heard a knock on the door. And they went to the door and there was a baker and he had enough bread, enough fresh bread to feed everyone in the orphanage. And at the same time, a milkman broke down right outside, right in front of the orphanage. And he gave them plenty of fresh milk. So they had milk and bread after George Mueller prayed. But when they sat down at that table, there was nothing. They didn't have anything to eat. But after his prayer, God began to make the provision for him. Actually, God already had it uh, in place before he actually prayed. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus gave us the model prayer. This is what we should ask every day of the Lord. Give me this day my daily bread. I give you thanks for it, Lord. Give me this day my daily bread. Not enough for a year's supply. Now, you know, we know that Joseph, he was able, because of a time of famine, he
he was able to store up. And that was, you know, an exception to the rule because God knew that there would be seven years of famine. And so it had to be stockpiled in that situation. But we should pray, God, give me this day my daily bread. Sometimes we in America, we've been so blessed and we want more than our daily bread. We want an excess. But we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 8, it said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy set-apart people as he promised you on oath if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to them. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. We think about in Genesis 26, Isaac, during a time of famine, the Lord spoke to him. And he says, I'm the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless, bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. And it's said of Isaac that he prospered in a time of famine. He was prospering when everybody else was going through difficulty. Here was uh, Isaac who was flourishing and prospering because God was with him. So what I'm trying to get across is yet I, I don't want us to live in fear even though there may be hard times coming. But we have to know that God will supply all our needs if we're walking in obedience to him. He has a commanded blessing that he will bring upon us. The Lord will open the heavens. This is Deuteronomy 28, 12. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. So we, no matter what goes on in the world systems, we have to know how to trust in Jesus, to trust in God to know that he will provide if we're doing, if we're walking in his, you know, following in his footsteps and doing his will and doing his purposes. Then he says, I will supply your needs, whatever those needs might be. So this is what he taught his disciples, and that includes us that we're to pray, give us this day our daily bread, just like he did with over two or three million people in the wilderness who were going from Egypt to the promised land. God made provision for them in a desert. He gave them food where it doesn't, didn't seem that there would be any food. Now here, I want us to get to a prophecy that was from Mark Taylor. Now, Mark Taylor is the fireman who lives in Florida, who had <clears throat> that God gave him a message in 2011, I believe it was, when he was listening to Donald Trump being interviewed on a television program, that God spoke to him and he said, this is the voice of a president. And Mark believed that God was telling him at that point that uh, Donald Trump would be president of the United States. Now, Mark thought that maybe that meant for 2012 that, that Trump would be elected as our president, but 
he didn't run in 2012. So here was Mark when Donald Trump declared that he was running for president. Mark was telling or letting people know at that point that he would be president of the United States. So Mark has had prophecies. The Lord has revealed things to him, and they have come to pass. So he has a track record of hearing the voice of God, God revealing things to him, and those uh, revelations have come to pass. So here's one. You see that it's dated December the 16th of 2016. And here's what the Spirit of God said to him. Energy, energy. I am releasing new energy. For this new energy that I am releasing will make my America and my Israel energy independent. For America and Israel will now be the top energy producers in the world. This new energy and the technology to capture it will spring forth from the depths as the volcano erupts from the depths. This is a sign that will be given. A massive volcanic eruption will signal that this is the time for my America and Israel and the end of the energy corruption. OPEC, your evil regime will no longer be tolerated. You will no longer be needed. For you refuse to listen to my words and have not heeded. For when that ring of fire blows its top, it will be a sign to you that you will lose your stock and the covenant you have with that ring will be lost. Well, there has been a volcanic eruption where people had to flee from that island. And um, maybe that was the fulfillment of that. But here, Mark is saying, or the Spirit of God was saying to Mark, that America and in Israel would be the top producers of energy in the world. And that the OPEC nations who have become greedy and who've, who've amassed so much wealth as a result of oil, that they will no longer be needed. Well, the funny thing is that Saudi Arabia and some of those OPEC nations, their wells are dry, drying up, actually. They are drying up. And, you know, the whole business in Syria, with all the nations that got involved in there, Turkey being one of them, what were they wanting? ISIS was supplying them with oil from Syria. That's what the biggest reason that there was so much terror, uh, so much conflict in Syria, it was over the oil. And that's why you had all the displaced people coming out of those areas is all because of oil. And Turkey and other nations, and I'm not saying that the United States was not involved in that as well, but they were buying oil on the black market at reduced rates. And then they were selling it at a higher price, but you know, also using it for their needs as well. But God is saying that corruption is going to come to an end. Now it continues, it says, you countries that have dominated injury, uh, energy for decades to move your evil agenda are charged with this guilt. Your days are numbered and you will say, say look how fast this was built. My America and my Israel will be one and because of this, you will be undone. Because of your rage and the money you made from those countries you manipulated and attacked from within, like Syria, you will now have to turn to those countries 
for help on a whim. For your wells will go dry and your finances too. For you will now be fed from the red, white, and blue. So here the Lord was saying exactly what's happening in Saudi Arabia and in some of these countries. Their wells are drying up. And now they are the ones that are going to have to come running to us, to Israel and to the United States, because Israel and the United States are going to be united. And the thing is, we've got Trump here in this country. We've got Netanyahu in Israel. And in both of those countries, both of our countries, there are those that want to take Trump out. There's those that want to take Netanyahu out. They're doing all that they can to destroy these two men. But God has anointed these two men and these two countries of ours because we blessed Israel by acknowledging Jerusalem as its capital and we're moving our embassy to Jerusalem God says, when you bless Israel, I'll bless you. When you curse Israel, you will be cursed. That's just what it says in Genesis. There is a commanded blessing upon everyone who blesses Israel. And there's a curse on those that put a curse on Israel and try to destroy it. So that's why... There's so much chaos in our country and in Israel is because the enemy, Satan, knows what is coming. That these two countries of ours are going to become strong and we're going to be energy sufficient. We're not going to have to rely on outside sources for our energy. God is going to provide for us. So here is, let me scoot this over, I'm sorry. Uh, here is current news. Now, Zion Oil in Israel, the CEO, Victor Carrillo, said, I am ecstatic to see clear evidence of hydrocarbons, which is oil and gas, in the deeper portions of our Megiddo Jezreel number one well, a project that we've been working on for years. I heard about Zion Oil, like it said, for uh, years ago, that they believed that there was oil and gas in, uh, in Israel, and they were working on it. But now they're seeing clear evidence that there is oil and glass, uh, gas there in Megiddo, Jezreel. Now, one thing about this, Megiddo, when you think about that, the Valley of Megiddo is where the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place that it talks about in the Bible, that God would put a hook in their jaw, Gog and Magog, and the countries that are associated with them our, uh, God's going to put a hook in their jaw and they're going to come just like they did in Syria to take the oil and gas. Well, you know, prophecy will be fulfilled. What is that hook? Well, oil and gas gets people attention. And that's why Syria has been just devastated. Basically, the, the driving factor is oil and gas. And uh, now Israel is saying this company, Zion Oil, is saying that they have clear evidence <clears throat> that it's there. So they're not going to comment on the commerciality or the ability to successfully produce the oil, but they're just asking people to pray for a safe and successful drilling, logging, and testing operations there, and that God would give them the wisdom for the management of this as they have to make some key decisions 
in the following days and weeks about this. But here's the thing on the stock exchange, their stocks went up 87% when the news came out that they had found these hydrocarbons there in Israel. God is bringing this to pass. We and Israel are going to be energy sufficient. God will supply our needs and the corruption is going to be judged. Those who have used uh, energy to gain their wealth and to promote their ideology, they will be humbled and they will be judged. So we need to pray for our president and for Netanyahu in Israel that they will stay strong, that they will be the wrecking ball in this whole situation. These are two strong leaders that are needed at this time. But here is God at work. Yes, the days will be perilous in the last days. We know that. We have to stand strong and we need to pray and undergird our leaders and pray that those who are corrupt, the wealthy, the elite, those that have, have just devastated this world over oil and gas, pray that but those that have just destroyed lives, who have murdered, who have stolen, who have done all the corruption in the, you know, that's, that's just coming out now. We haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. I mean, there's more and more that's going to be revealed as time goes on. But we need to pray and stand strong and lift up the hands of Trump and Netanyahu and pray for our nation that we will follow God, that we will obey God so that the blessings that God has pronounced will take place in our countries and in our own individual lives as we walk and obey in obedience to the Lord. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you make a distinction between those who are walking in your footsteps and those who aren't. And I pray for our leaders. I pray that you give them courage and stamina and resolve. Help them not to become discouraged or disheartened. Help them not to give up. Help them not to uh, go back on the course that you've set them on. But may they fulfill their destiny. They are destined for such a time as this. And so are we. We are part of this army of God that must arise and come against the darkness that's in our world. Give us a passion to do your will, Father, that your will would be done here upon this earth. You gave us this earth. You want us to take dominion of this earth to take back what the enemy has stolen, that there may be peace and justice and mercy done for all peoples. In Jesus' name, amen.